This video is brought to you by MUBI, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Try MUBI free for 30 days at MUBI.com slash CinemaTyler. For the cinematography of Full Metal Jacket, Stanley Kubrick would choose Douglas Milsom. Milsom had been involved in every Kubrick production beginning with The Clockwork Orange in 1971, where he worked as the focus puller for cinematographer John Alcott, making sure that the focus was correct during each take. I don't think the Kubrick thing came along because I was a sort of replacement assistant. Um, Stanley has a uh, very, he's very fussy about definition and sharpness of the image, which was true as well. And I think they had a couple of you know, things where it wasn't right, and I came in to take over. During the filming of The Shining in the late 70s, Milsom was Alcott's first assistant, and when Alcott had to leave for another project, Kubrick had Milsom shoot some first unit footage. What's interesting is that the actual shooting of Full Metal Jacket only took about six months, when you remove the hiatus from Lee Ermey's recovery after his car accident. However, Milsom was working on the film for a year and a half. This was because of Kubrick's extensive pre-production, there's a great interview with Milsom for American Cinematographer magazine, and much of the info for this episode comes from that interview. In the interview, Milsom said, Sometimes it becomes a plod, because it's so slow and intricate. But Kubrick loves to do things quite differently than what's ever been done before. You can't really do that sort of thing off the top of your head. So you work very hard to get it together and make something different which bears his mark. That can be a little overbearing, and it tends to zap you and take up nearly all of your time. Sometimes the relationship can get a little strained because you've got to be devoted to him. You eat, drink, and sleep the movie, and you're under contract to Stanley, body and soul. But he allows you the time to get everything absolutely right, which is what I find so rewarding. But one thing was particularly important to Kubrick. He wanted to shoot Full Metal Jacket sort of like a documentary, with little to no lighting equipment. But how did he do it? This is making film. Perhaps the earliest discussion between Milsom and Kubrick was what the movie would actually look like. They had originally discussed shooting it really big, 65mm in black and white. The idea was to have it look like 1962's The Longest Day, about the D-Day landings at Normandy. If you visited the Traveling Kubrick exhibition, you'll know that Kubrick was obsessed with collecting the most state-of-the-art equipment, and nearly all of the equipment used by Milsom on Full Metal Jacket was owned by Kubrick himself. So Kubrick bought two 65mm cameras for Milsom to test extensively. Then the idea was to do it more like a documentary in 16mm. So Kubrick bought some 16mm cameras for Milsom to test. All in all, these two ideas had Milsom test around 7 cameras and 70 or 80 lenses. Ultimately, Kubrick and Milsom decided to film on 35mm, but make it look as if it was shot on something smaller by desaturating the image as much as possible. Before production began, Milsom would end up testing over a hundred lenses. Milsom said, There's always an awful lot to discuss with Stanley during pre-production, because there's so much involved with his films. They are always big subjects, so the cinematographer is often brought in quite a bit earlier than usual, not just to check the equipment, but to check every single aspect of every possible situation to the nth degree. It involves painstaking time for discussion. He's just as methodical in his prep as he is in his shooting. Sometimes his prep takes as long as his shooting, often longer. He gives new meaning to the word meticulous and the word methodical. Since a large section of the movie would take place mainly in one room, a major part of the pre-production involved a model of the barrack set. This model was built by production designer Anton Furst. Milsom and Kubrick would use the model to discuss how to light the set, and then they would do extensive testing based on those discussions. They ended up making models of many of the various locations in the film. Matthew Modine, who played Private Joker, talks about this in his Full Metal Jacket Diary, writing, Stanley shows me a scale model of the military base in Da Nang. Then he introduces me to Anton Furst, the production designer who built the model. Stanley takes a little video lens and places it in the model. The video is hooked up to a television, and we are able to see what the actual base will look like. I've never seen anybody do this before. It's exciting to be working with someone so prepared. Kubrick had taken a similar approach during pre-production on The Shining. Here, you can see models of the exterior of the hotel, as well as the gold room. And he would continue using this method on Eyes Wide Shut. 
A little oversimplified, Alice, but yes, something like that. Because Kubrick and Milsom wanted Full Metal Jacket to have a documentary look, they used a high-speed film, Kodak 5294, with an 800 ASA. ASA, or ISO, refers to how sensitive the film is to light. The more sensitive your film is, the less light you need to get a proper exposure, and the more grain there will be in the frame. So using an 800 ASA instead of, let's say, a 400 ASA, meant that the footage would be much grainier and they wouldn't need to bring in powerful lights to get an exposure indoors. The grainy look added to the documentary feel, and Kubrick could have the interiors, particularly the barrack set, lit with natural looking light coming through the windows to make the scenes appear even more realistic. In an interview with Gene Siskel, Kubrick revealed the look he tried to get from the lighting, saying, I just try to photograph things realistically. I try to light them as they really would be lit. When inside, I use practical lights and windows, and not any supplemental lights. Milsom said, The ASA should have been 400, so we were pushing it a little beyond where it would have given us a really solid black. By pushing the film all the way, we were able to bring the fog level up, and there was a natural lean toward the milkier, less solid blacks and grays which documentary film tends to have. The film helped us a lot in achieving that look, coupled with the fact that we were working wide open. When Milsom says that they pushed the film, it means that they likely used a film stock with a lower ASA and then increased the ASA during the development process. And when Milsom says that they were working wide open, he's referring to the camera's aperture being open all the way to let in the maximum amount of light. So basically, the camera was set to let in as much light as possible, and they shot the equivalent of having an extra sensitive film stock, and therefore, Kubrick and Milsom were able to get away with using very minimal lighting setups, or none at all. John Alcott had been a very resourceful cinematographer, and it rubbed off onto Milsom, who said, Most of Alcott's lighting went into one suitcase, and that's what I like, and it's what Stanley likes too. This resourcefulness also extended to his very small crew, about 15 people. With a small crew and simple and sparse lighting setups, Kubrick could set up shots quickly and spend more time on getting the performances right. Kubrick had only one electrician on the set, and his job was to quote, simply operate the lights on a dimmer. The electrician was part of the union, so he had to be paid for a day's work even when he was just coming in to turn the lights on. So Kubrick sent the electrician to his house to fix some wiring because he was paying him for the day anyway. What's interesting though, for exterior shots during the day, they used the same wide open aperture and high ASA film and used no exterior lights apart from daylight. This gave them the look they wanted, but when shooting outside, the sun would be too powerful for a wide open aperture with an extra sensitive ASA. They would usually only shoot when the sun was rising or setting, or during the day when the sky was overcast. But if there was a lot of daylight, rather than make the aperture smaller and use a less sensitive film stock, which would alter the look they were going for, Milsom stacked a lot of neutral density filters onto the front of the lens to reduce the amount of light transmission through the lens, which also lowered the amount of contrast in each shot. This is why the image has sort of a flat look to it. Milsom said that keeping the aperture wide open in the daylight also allowed him to use the depth of field to bring out all of the flying dirt, shell casings, and fire in the scenes. So it was as if they were overexposing the image, even during a brightly lit day. Milsom also said that they normally would have used an 85 filter to warm up the image, but they would lose two thirds of a stop making the image a bit darker. They decided to go without the 85 filter, which allowed them to shoot for an extra half hour as the sun was going down. Good night, ladies. Good night, sir. They didn't do any day for night shots where you shoot before the sun has gone down, but underexpose the image so that it looks like nighttime. All the night shots were actually shot at night. These shots were lit by windy lights, attached to a cherry picker. Milsom said, They can light an enormous area from over 200 yards away. They each took about 1200 amps, and we could actually light an area of 400 square yards quite easily at a light level of T1.4. T1.4 is referring to the wide open aperture. Because the windy lights are so big and difficult to move around, they had four of them positioned in different areas of exterior night scenes. So if they needed to quickly change the camera angle or move to a different area, they could simply turn off one of them and turn on another one to simulate moonlight in the position they needed. To fill out the light, they would bounce the light from the Wendy's onto the actors using sheets of styrene. 
They also had the trucks and jib arms that the Wendy's were on covered in black, so they would be hidden if there was a need to pan across the area. So even when shooting at night, Cooper could point the camera in any direction without having to move any lights. Kubrick said, I'm after a realistic, documentary-type look in the film, especially during the fighting. Even the steady cam shots purposefully aren't steady. We wanted a newsreel effect. Kubrick had done the newsreel shaky cam effect as far back as Dr. Strangelove, but in Full Metal Jacket, the steady cam mixed with the minimal lighting creates a freedom of movement that immerses you in the action and gives a strong sense of authenticity to what you are seeing. For many of the shots in Full Metal Jacket, they had the camera mounted on a luma crane which allowed for low-angled tracking shots that they could raise up high if needed. A tulip crane with a sky cam extension allowed them to get over 30 feet high. There was a hothead rig on the luma crane that could be controlled remotely, so they didn't have to sit on the crane. This is how they were able to get these tracking shots that were more controlled than the steady cam shots. Milsom said, Because we were using the luma crane quite often, we decided to have the crane ready assembled on a track always. Although the crane itself is not that heavy, about a thousand pounds, it does take some hours to put together. They also had a 60-seat bus that they modified to hold the fully assembled crane, which allowed them to simply drive it into whatever position they needed, secure it with hydraulic jacks, and be ready to shoot within minutes. They used this setup for the great boots are made for walking shot. I imagine that the crane allowed them to get a smooth forward-moving tracking shot without the tracks being visible, because they could just set up the tracks to the side and have the arm of the crane positioned further out. Kubrick also had a modified Citroen Mahari that he used a lot on Barry Lyndon. The engine was removed and two cameras were mounted on it, so they could do tracking shots much faster than a crane could do. There would usually be about six people pushing it, with three or four camera operators and one person steering. The car's suspension made for a much smoother shot than if they tried to do a fast tracking shot on a dolly. For Barry Lyndon, the car was used for many of the tracking shots across fields, where the ground was soft and uneven. There were a few big complex shots where the timing had to be absolutely right. One of these was the scene with the first wave of the Tet Offensive. I imagine that they used the Citroen Mahari for this shot. Milsom said, Choreographing our camera movement was extremely important, otherwise we'd waste a lot of money on effects we wouldn't catch on film if we'd missed our mark. It became a question of rehearsing a number of times to ensure we got it right. Another of these highly choreographed shots was this tracking shot of the news crew filming the action. Jay Cox notes the three kinds of parallel movement, the news crew, stretchers, and the camera itself, as being a style of one of Kubrick's favorite directors, David Lean. For this shot, the tank firing had to be perfectly timed with the explosion in the building being detonated by the crew. For shots like these, Kubrick would be on a walkie-talkie directing the helicopters to come in and circle back around. For explosions to go off, and for the tanks to roll up at the right time. By the way, the sound guy in the news crew was the actual sound guy for the movie. Help, 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 help. Kubrick wanted to shoot the whole movie using Nikon still camera lenses. He bought every Nikon lens available and had his Freeze NC motion picture camera adapted to mount the lenses. Why he purchased a lot of these sort of lenses because they were fast. Mm -hmm. You know, like you know, the Camoras and the Amigas and the Aquas. They were sort of 1.3s and 1.2s and things like that. He had, you know, 0.95. Mm -hmm. We used mm -hmm. quite a bit of. If you've seen my video on Kubrick's cameras, you'll know that the Nikon F was a favorite among combat photographers during the Vietnam War. Rafterman is often seen with two Nikon F cameras around his neck. The Nikon F was so rugged that it actually saved the life of British photojournalist Don McCullen when it stopped a bullet aimed at his head. Screenwriter and friend of Kubrick, Jay Cox, noted that Kubrick's compositions seem to be more inspired by war photography than motion picture footage of the war. Cox believes that Kubrick was most inspired by the war photography of Robert Kappa during the 30s and 40s. Kappa is thought to be one of, if not the, best combat photographers who have ever lived, and was the only civilian photographer who landed on Omaha Beach during D-Day with the Allied troops. He died in 1954 at the age of 40 when he stepped on a landmine while on assignment for Life magazine during the first Indochina War. In order to get the exact composition he wanted, Kubrick had a special viewfinder made that could attach the actual lenses he would shoot with, so instead of an approximation, he could see exactly what the shot would look like. In his Full Metal Jacket diary, Matthew Modine writes about a time when they were shooting this scene. Kubrick was walking around with his special viewfinder, and when he found the frame that he wanted, he yelled out for the dolly grip to mark it. 
The dolly grip came over and marked the spot with chalk, and measured the height with measuring tape within a fraction of an inch. They moved the camera in and Cooper came back and looked through the viewfinder and said that the camera wasn't in the right spot. So they did the whole process over again. The grips couldn't get the camera into the exact position, so one of the grips erased the chalk mark and drew a new one only a couple of inches away. Cooper came back and it still didn't look right, so he had the grips spend an hour breaking concrete so the camera would fit in the exact spot he wanted. Well, Stanley was a great cinematographer himself, and I think it's no secret that Stanley took a very, very strong hand in shooting his own movies, and I think on some occasions operating himself. Composition was very, very important to him, but when we think of composition, we usually think of something very formal and academic. And what you're looking at here is something that's very ordered, but seems to be very spontaneous at the same time. The aim was to make the action scenes not only dramatic, but understandable. But even when the camera was moving, Kubrick maintained his strong compositions. The boot camp sequence takes place at the Paris Island Marine Corps Recruit Depot in South Carolina. However, as we learned in the video on Full Metal Jacket's production design, the entire film was shot in England. The production built the barracks set in the London borough of Enfield. About an hour's drive from the barracks set was the training grounds where all of the outdoor boot camp scenes were filmed. These shots were filmed at an actual Royal Air Force base in Basingbourne. What's interesting is that in 1943, legendary director William Wyler shot a documentary at Basingbourne called The Memphis Bell, a story of a flying fortress about a Boeing B-17 flying fortress. The documentary was meant to build morale by, quote, showing the everyday courage of the men who manned the bombers. Perhaps even more interesting, though, is that in 1990, a fictionalized version of the story was made into a movie starring Matthew Modine, although it wasn't filmed in Basingbourne. John Alcott had taught Milsom a system for measuring light that Kubrick had used as far back as the production of 2001 A Space Odyssey. The system involved using a Polaroid camera to get a quick preview of how the light would look on film that you couldn't get from just looking through the viewfinder or watching playback. Milsom said, He taught me how to use black and white Polaroids to measure a great deal more than just exposure. It gives you the balance and allows you to go much higher or lower than the meter would otherwise indicate against film speed. The Polaroid film delineates very well between light and shade, and also gives a tremendously good idea of how windows are going to look if they're over or under lit. This system would really come in handy when shooting the scenes in the barracks, which featured large windows lining both sides of the room. Because Kubrick's opening shot in the barracks required the camera to follow Gunnery Sergeant Hartman around the room, showing the full 360 degrees of the space, they had to make sure that there weren't any lighting setups visible in the shot. Milsom would use the same technique that Alcott used to simulate the natural light in Barry Lyndon's interiors and the lobby of the Overlook Hotel. All of the lights were positioned outside of the set and shining down through the windows. Milsom said, We use the PAR 600 watt lamps. Each light has six 100 watt bulbs on it. We put four of these lamps outside each of the seven windows of the set, so we had 24,000 watts burning outside each window. We had them filtered through the Roscoe Plastic 216 fiber, which gave us a very nice, soft, warm look. To get the smooth shot of Hartman giving his introduction to the recruits, they used an old Moviola dolly with air-filled tires. Because the floor of the barrack set wasn't very smooth, they let a lot of the air out of the tires until they were nearly flat which made the tires compress more in different areas to allow for a super smooth movement through the space. Here, you can see the Moviola dolly in action while they shoot the this is my rifle, this is my gun bit. The shots of, of Lee coming up and down the bunks along the barracks was something that was done over and over again because Stanley wanted it. Just the rhythm of the camera and, and Lee's movements to be perfect. And you can, if you notice the composition of these shots, they're just amazing composition. Just, I, I remember him paying Stanley paying a lot of attention to, to that. And just because the camera is moving and just because a character is moving didn't mean that the composition had to change. Or if it did change, it should change in, in a way that um, was as strong as, as the last composition. Well, no shit. The blocking was usually based on the camera setup. Kubrick would have the actors rehearse and he'd walk around with a viewfinder. And when he found a good angle, he would adjust the blocking saying things like, you can't step to the side. If you step to the side, it's not good. 
Most of the other scenes in the barracks take place at night, so Milsom used warm white deluxe daylight fluorescent tubes on the ceiling. There is no hidden light source inside the barracks. The entire space is lit with the lights you see in the scene. The lighting in there is just all uh, neon lights, and it's a very harsh lighting. This gave Kubrick the freedom to place his camera anywhere in the room, without having to worry about changing the lighting setup. When it came time to shoot the pivotal blanket party scene, and more importantly, Pyle's death scene, Kubrick would go beyond the naturalistic lighting of the previous scenes, and instead create a stylized blue moonlight that would heighten the reality and create a dreamlike feel to the scenes. But Kubrick and Milsom would need to somehow light the bathroom as if the only light source was moonlight coming through the windows. What is your major malfunction, num nuts? You know, it took seven days to light that bathroom. Every morning, the first thing we would do when Stanley come in, we would go right to that head. And he would adjust filters and lights and get rid of this. He wanted an icy, cold, blue ambiance. And I think he accomplished that mission, too. One thing you'll notice about Pyle's death scene is the same eerie blue moonlight that was present in the blanket party scene. This was meant to contrast the warm pink light of Milsom's daylight shots in and around the barracks. The question of what Pyle would do when he finally snaps has been teased almost continuously. And despite Pyle just having graduated from basic training, the same music and lighting from the blanket party scene cues us in such a way that we know something bad is going to happen before we have any reason to think so. Joker finds Pyle sitting in the barracks bathroom. Hi, Joker. In an interview, Kubrick said that the only aspect of the set design in the Paris Island boot camp section of the film that was unrealistic was the toilets facing each other. In reality, there would be toilets on only one side of the wall. I'm guessing that this was done to fit with Kubrick's style of parallel lines and symmetry. He said that he thinks the toilet arrangement is, quote, more like something in a Bunuel film. According to Ermi, the reason it took seven days to light the bathroom was that Kubrick wanted the light to reflect off the tile in a certain way. You'll notice here that all of the light in this scene is coming from outside the windows. This is how they lit every shot in the scene. Milsom detailed how they lit the scene, saying, We wanted to introduce a strong moonlight effect, which I think worked and gave a weird feeling to it all. It's similar to the blue light we used in the maze in The Shining. For this scene, we used an open Fresnel Brute, which gave us very sharp shadows, and four 10K HMIs, white flame without condensers, so they also cast very long and definite shadows. The brute was placed at one end, giving a much wider, brighter beam, and the other four windows were each lit by one of the 10K HMIs. We then put half blues over them to give us a kind of Hollywood moonlight glow. In order to make the angle of the light appear to be coming from the moon, they put the lights four stories high and aimed them downwards to shine through the windows. Milsom goes on to say, we use polystyrene to bounce the light, or we bounce the light off a thousand watt snooted lowell off the ceiling, just to reflect a bit of white light into the shadow side. Vincent D'Onofrio does the Kubrick stare throughout the scene, and they were able to bounce the light off the white tile giving more definition in his eyes. I want to take a moment to thank this episode's sponsor, Mubi. Mubi is a curated streaming service tailor-made for cinephiles like you. Mubi features a lineup of great films, handpicked by experts, non-algorithm, that take you on a guided journey through the best that cinema has to offer, with a new film added every single day. What's really cool is how Mubi curates the releases into retrospectives, specials, and specific subgenres. It's like having your own personal film festival that you can stream anytime, anywhere. Right now, you can check out Dutch Engel, Chaz Gerritsen in Apocalypse Now, a documentary short about a photographer's experience capturing incredible behind-the-scenes photos on the set of Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now, or check out the original Girl with the Dragon Tattoo trilogy of films following a hacker and disgraced journalist as they unravel a mystery of a woman's disappearance. Also, during the month of July, Mubi is celebrating the Cannes Film Festival with a wonderful lineup of films, including exclusive streaming premieres from the most prestigious international film festivals, and rediscovered classics selected by movies curators. All of this and much, much more are available right now on Mubi. Try Mubi free for 30 days at Mubi.com slash CinemaTyler. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash CinemaTyler for a whole month of great cinema for free. Or join CinemaTyler on Patreon at the $5 level and get extended access to Mubi as a perk. Thanks for watching.